Hi everyone, it's Mrs. Van, your friendly neighborhood English teacher, and it is showtime. Okay, I am so excited about today. I've been looking forward to this since not last Saturday, but the Saturday before when I decided to even do this. So let's see what you think. All right, my first question for you is, have you ever failed at something? Because this whole story is about someone who fails at something with absolutely tragic consequences. So I think that it is one of the most important questions to ask. A little bit of white noise. A little bit of white noise. My husband tells me that there's a little bit of white noise. So I'm gonna go pull my mic down just a little bit and see if that helps. Okay, so um, we've got, let me, oops, I gotta pull my chat back forward so I can see what you guys have to say. Uh, hopefully you've all failed this stuff. I hope I'm seeing yes or like if you've never failed at anything, then I'm really curious about you. Now, I think one of the things that is important in this story is that sometimes there are stories that stick with you, right? Like you read them and you think about them days, weeks, months, even years later. Sometimes you even remember where you were when you heard it and I th or read it for the first time. And I think that in this story, this, this did it for me. This story was that for me. I can still remember the first time I read it and how profoundly like I felt, I just had so many feelings surrounding it. And we can get creeped out. I mean, a lot of times the stories that do that for us are kind of um, creepy a little bit. And we can think, I shouldn't have read that story. It's kind of scary. Like, I don't want to think about that. And this story is my favorite because it does that because it makes me think and it makes me think about things that are sometimes hard to think about. And I love stories that do that. And I love stories that make me focus on like, what did I learn from this? And it was disturbing. And how did I let the fact that it disturbed me make me a better person? So scale of one to five, I want to see what you have to say about it. If you read the long version, it was 17 pages. So that is a lot of reading. Um, curious about what you think um, so some uh, maybe not quite as popular as some of the others and maybe I can change your mind all right it, it, you didn't like it okay now some of you liked it maybe you're just saying you liked it because you know that I like it so much no, I'm just kidding you can say whatever you want right 4.19 you can always count on elephant swift to give me a nice number I think yesterday was 2.89 so Nice, a 4.25 is very good. Didn't finish the story. Wow, if you don't finish the story, like go back and read the short one at least, right? You're gonna wanna read the story now after today though, I think, okay. Um, the idea of a story being too long, like, well, go read the short one then, but um, this, this, even though 17 pages is on the longer side, I mean, really, it's 17 pages double space, so it's not horrible. Man up, right, all right. Boring. Oh my word, Jonathan Stout, I'm about time you out for that. No, you can say anything but not boring. All right. Okay, so before we jump in to, to build a fire, let's give some shout outs to some of the people participating yesterday. So I just loved this. Um, th I got tagged on Facebook with this and I just loved it. I Look at the binder with the stories printed out. Like that just warmed my teacher heart. So I just love that picture. And this is one of your fellow students there. Um, and then this is Jay Sanders telling Plankster why she wants to move to Texas. And um, I can totally sympathize with you because why wouldn't you want to move to Texas? So amazing. And then I, I love this insight. And this was about the climax of the story. And I had said the climax of the story was when Muffin came running and saved Daisy. And Kurt Kemmerer is making this argument that if Daisy had given the reader similar emotional intensity about the bomb drop, like if we had seen more emotion from Daisy in the bomb drop, in the same way, right, how the author was doing all of those present participles and had all those great verbs, if that author had done that with regard to the bombs, you know, like, bombs dropping, buildings imploding, like if they had done that, then we would have felt more there and it would have made the moment more of a climax. And that is a really important point because one of the things it says is authors 
by their words have a lot of power to make us see what they want us to see and to make us hear what they want us to hear. Um, so that was nice. I like this from Erin, that it's your favorite time of day because you get to be social, but also have fun learning. And to me, that's the very best day of all, right? That's the very best thing of all, when I can learn something and be social. So thanks for that. And then, oh, like we were talking about like, what's something that is normal to you, but may seem abnormal to other people. And there were a lot of them. I read over all of them. And a lot of them, I was thinking, wow, you know, like the 19 hours of gymnastics a week. That was a lot. There were just a lot of things about staying up really late or getting up really early. And so there were a lot of things that made me think, oh, I wonder what, um, I wonder what that would be like. And this one was the one that made me think, oh, because just two hours a day on a bus, I mean, like, I don't think school buses have Wi-Fi yet, so you're just, like, there. And I wondered, like, do you do homework? Do you, like, try to do your homework balanced on your knees? Do you talk to friends? Do you listen to books on your phone? Like, what do you do for that two hours? This is really curious. Um, oh, just a lot. And then, oh, this universal truth, right? Hashtag truth, villains have the best backstories. In fact, when I read that from Brian, the thing that I thought, and I know that sometimes I'm saying the username and that's not really your name, but that's okay, because we're doing privacy here. Um, so this made me think about how when JK Rowling, when they were making the Harry Potter movies, the only character who she told the whole story to was, was Alan Rickman who was playing Snape because she felt that he needed to know the whole story arc in order to play the character correctly and he did have the best backstory and so I, I it made me think of that here so um Lucia she left the readers with some open questions and that's good and I had criticized the author for not telling us why is this dog scared like why is this dog wary of people you don't do a good job and Lucian kind of calls me out on it gives a little pushback and I said this yesterday good readers push back you push back against the author you push back against the characters and you push back against the teacher and so you push back against with with thought with good argument and this is a good argument that the author left us with some open questions, left some room for the reader to think. Very, very, very good point. Very good point. And then said, can you start an adjective clause with that? And the answer to this is yes. And then Noah, I accidentally wrote 400 words on the first one. And Noah, we all want to know how you accidentally write 400 words. No problem writing longer. It's no problem. But it's just kind of funny because they're all like, oh, accidentally. Like, oh, I tripped and my pen accidentally wrote 400 words. And then the quote of the day from Cloudfall2260, if people could just read each other's minds every once in a while, we could all see how connected and how similar we really are. And that would make the world a better place. I just, that should be on a t-shirt. Like, I just love that. That is truly, truly, truly beautiful. So thank you for that universal truth pegged right in the comments in a YouTube video. Like, so amazing. So fantastic. Thank you. All right, ready to dive in? Now we're going to do the same thing with the story that we do with all the stories, which is that we're going to go through the plot. And you probably notice that the classes are structured pretty similarly. I do have a teensy, teensy, teensy little surprise um, near the end today. But, um, that's different than normal, but um, it's not that exciting. Don't get all excited. Don't tell me later. Like, Ms. Van, that wasn't a very cool surprise, but I do have something a little bit different for you today. All right. Um, okay. I wish that we were in real school together because when I teach this story in real life, I bring in flashlights for every kid in the class and we turn off the lights and we sit on the floor in the dark and we read by flashlight and we are all bundled up in blankets because we're getting colder and colder and I make a fake campfire out of chaser lights like you'd have at Christmas and then red crumpled up and orange crumpled up cellophane on top of it so it looks like a campfire and then as when his fire goes out, we turn out the campfire. And by the end of it, I mean, we're in Texas and I usually teach this in May. So it's like 106 degrees and we're all freezing and our teeth are chattering. And I just wish we could be in class together and be like around a fake campfire and reading by flashlight um, so that we could have this full experience. Ugh, okay. 
to the plot, to the plot, to the plot, plot, plot. Okay, so here's our plot arc. Um, and we have the backstory. This man living in the Yukon uh, is on his way to meet the boys at Camp Henderson. And he, the inciting incident is interesting because we don't see it. This is another inciting incident that occurs before, and then the reader is brought into the story later, and we see the inciting incident as a flashback. And it, the inciting incident in this story is that this character um, in the story, the man, he ignores the warning of the old man, and he sets out alone in, despite the cold. And it is... This, it's really the setting that sets this story in motion, right? There'd be no story if this happened in July because it wouldn't be cold, right? So the inciting incident had a necessary factor and that necessary factor was the setting. But I'd like to make another suggestion here. I think it's possible that there's not only a physical inciting incident, but also a psychological one. I think it's that what sets the story in motion is the man's attitude, that it's psychological. Um, and we'll dive a little bit more into that later. Erin, I just saw that go by that you saw me talk at Keller High School, and that is so cool. What a small world. All right, so then after the inciting incident, we have a series of unfortunate events, and then we lead to this climax. Now, I think this is another story, yet another story, where you can argue that there are two possible climaxes, just like Muffin. And I think these stories could not be more different, and yet they have this same structural similarity, which is you could either argue, either, you could argue either that the climax is when he falls through the ice or that the climax is when the snow falls and puts out his fire. And you could argue both. And I think that London does that on purpose. And I am going to back my assertion up with evidence from the text a little later. Okay. So, and the, he's actually, yeah, yeah, he's in Alaska. It's cold. Okay. And then after whatever climax you choose, we still have this, a series of unfortunate events. And then it ends with, the man freezes to death and the dog survives. So sorry, if you haven't read it yet, then you are getting a big spoiler right here. So the ultimate spoiler. So what are your thoughts? I'm curious. Any, um, I feel like the falling through the ice could be the inciting incident. That's interesting. That, um, yeah, maybe so, right? Like that maybe that's what really sets in motion, but, but that couldn't have happened unless he had set out. Like, it's a little late in the story to be an inciting incident. I, I think you can make that argument. I don't think that's a problem. Um, so, and then Ben says, my mom saw you at Allen High School. That's so weird. We got a lot of Texas people in here. All right. A, a new series of unfortunate events. Yes, yes, yes. I'm going to come back to that. Couldn't the climax be him not being able to build another fire? Do you know? Yes, that's true. Except that his not being able to build another fire lasts a really, really long time. And a, a climax is usually much more brief than that. Okay. Uh, yeah, you could rewrite you could rewrite the ending if you want to. Right now, we have a, everybody's happy that the dog lives, right? We, isn't that interesting? We'd be more upset if the dog died and the man lived. It's so weird. Humans are like that. Okay. So this story has two major overarching themes. Man versus nature and knowledge versus instinct. And we are going to explore both of those themes. There are two overarching questions in the story. Oops, I, I, I advanced too quickly. All right, two overarching questions. What is the relationship between man and nature? And what is the difference between knowledge and instinct and which one is superior? And London has a very strong opinion about both of these things. Okay. So... In order to discuss this, we do need to go into the literary element of conflict for a minute so that we know that we're all on the same page because London does a kind of conflict that is seen in some stories. If any of you have read Hatchet, if any of you have read The Other Side of the Mountain, um, if any of you have seen the movie, um, what, what's the Tom Hanks movie, honey, where he's on the island? Well, if you've seen that movie where Tom Hanks is stranded and he has the volleyball Wilson, that's 
that's the same thing. And that is a, a specific kind of conflict that we see in this story. Now, what conflict is, is a struggle between opposing forces or an obstacle of some kind. And the conflict is what drives the story. A story with no conflict is not a story. Nobody would read it. Nobody would read it. Conflict is always what drives the story. It's why people will even read like um, kind of formulaic fiction where they know what's going to happen. They know how it's going to end, but they read it anyway. It's still exciting anyway because conflict drives the story. Now, I've had English teachers argue with me about this, but I actually think it's true that conflict requires the protagonist to make a decision. Castaway, I'm sorry. Castaway, my husband just said, Castaway is the name of the movie I was trying to think of. So I think that conflict always requires the protagonist to make a decision. That whenever you have a conflict, you have to decide, are you going to change or are you not in the face of conflict? And you can make three decisions. You can decide to change yourself. You can decide to change your environment or if you can change the obstacle or you can leave. You can absent yourself from the conflict. So those are essentially your three choices. And I believe that all protagonists will make some kind of decision based on the conflict that they face. So there are two kinds of conflict, external conflict and internal conflict. Internal conflict, it's easy to remember what it is because... There is man versus himself. Oh, you know what? I had that Hunger Games picture and then I didn't say anything about it. And the reason that I want to say something about it is because it is a very clear decision that she makes, right? That she there's a conflict and she makes a decision. And in fact, she makes decision after decision after decision. I just think it's a perfect example. All right, so internal and external conflict. Internal conflict, man versus himself. It's when you're like trying to make a decision. If you're trying to decide what to do, then you have an internal conflict. Like you're trying to make a decision that affects you. You have something within yourself working against you. And then like an an example of internal conflict, man versus himself would be something like trying to decide whether to tell the truth when telling a lie would be easier. Trying to decide, you know, things like that. That's a man versus himself. External conflict comes in so, so many flavors. And you'll see different lists. Like some people say, oh, there are four kinds. Oh, there's five kinds. These are like all the kinds. So you can have man versus man. So I'm in competition with a person. I can have man versus nature. I can have man versus machine. So this is like sci-fi robots are coming. And, you know, uh, we see that somewhat in Star Wars. Man versus fate. Like somebody is fighting against their destiny. Um like your only hope obi-wan and then man versus society and that's that's the conflict you see in hunger games where somebody is in conflict with a you like utopic slash dystopic society and then you have man versus time and this can happen when you are out of sync with your time meaning that you have ideas that don't fit in the time that you live or and it can also mean where you're racing against time so you can have two different kinds I'm like, my hands are just going. Uh, That you can have two different kinds of man versus time. Okay, so in this story, big reveal, we have two conflicts. We have man versus himself in all of these decisions that he has to make about what he's going to do. And also man versus himself in the sense that he's acting in his own best disinterest, right? Like he is his own obstacle, And then man versus nature. And this is a huge issue for London. London was a naturalist writer. And I'm going to talk about that more later. But this idea that nature as the enemy rather than the sweet, beautiful thing is is prevalent in London's writing. And just as a really weird coincidence, and I didn't find this out until years after I'd read the story for the first time. So this is not why I love it. Is that Jack London is actually a distant cousin of mine and my mom's if she's watching. Um, So into the story yeah you might want a jacket or a blanket or slippers all right day had broken cold and gray exceeding the cold and gray when the man now notice we do not get the character named and we never get the character named. the protagonist is never named that is really unusual he has no name and he never will I just thought I would give a shout out to see how many of you, if you read the longer version, did you notice the use of the word Paul? And if you remember, we learned that word. We just learned that word in Desiree's Baby. And this is just 
one more reason why the more you read, the more you get out of what you read. Because you get all these little gems of, I know that word. I saw that word. It makes you think of that story that you read. And then you're all happy because you love that story. All right. So I want to give us a picture of where we are here. This is the Yukon Territory of Canada. What we're talking about in this story is actually slightly west of this into Alaska. So we, but we are up in this very, very, very cold area. And it's important to know where we are because just like it means something in Muffin, the setting, it means something here too. So I want to show you, this is me in early September of last year in the Yukon. And uh, it doesn't look like this in the winter, people. It's not all green. <laughs> So you could go there at different times of year and it would be a very, very, very different um, experience. So here it's like all beautiful and green. It's warm. You can see I'm just wearing a light sweater and I'm, I'm plenty warm out there and I'm on a train. In the winter, friends, it looks like this. It looks like this. And this is a picture of Jack London himself with one of the kinds of dogs he's talking about in this story. This is the exact kind of dog he's talking about in the story. Oh, someone's from Canada. Oh, a couple of you from Canada. That is so cool. Um, my my great grandmother was a hundred percent Canadian. Um, she's their Quebecois. How cool! All right. So, uh, and and I see someone comment. It looked beautiful. Yes, it did. It was really beautiful. All right. So this is Jack London, and. I want you to see this beautiful writing, this strong sense of place that London gives us. Pure white, north and south, as far as I could see, it was unbroken white. Notice these just different words that he's using to show this feeling. The atmosphere is so gray and so white that you almost can't see. I don't know if any of you have ever been outside in snow on an overcast day. It is very hard to see. You literally feel like you cannot see. And that's the feeling that he's giving. Um, somebody asks, is it possible that nature is the protagonist and the man is the antagonist? And the reason that that's um, not possible, it's an interesting idea. The reason it's not possible is because na um, the man is not acting against nature. The protagonist needs to be acting against, the, I'm sorry, the antagonist needs to be acting against you. And he's not acting really against nature. He's just not acting in harmony with nature. He's not helping or hurting nature. Um, okay, so here we get, the first sign, the first sign that this man has a fatal flaw. And it's an interesting take on a common fatal flaw. There's a common fatal flaw in literature of hubris, which is the fancy English teacher word for excessive pride. And here what we have is excessive pride specifically directed at how he respects nature. It's our first sign that this man is hopelessly out of touch that he's not paying attention to what he should and that he's ignoring the instinct that we all should have for respect of the unknown, that he's new. He's at what they call the Chichaquo and this was his first winter. He should have been scary, right? He should have been worried and concerned and respectful. And here London tells us flat out, the trouble with him was that he was without imagination. I love this line. He was quick and alert in the things of life but only in the things and not in the significances. This is the crux of the comic conflict. The man knows the facts. He has knowledge, but he, he doesn't really use it. And I'd also like to point out that this is a nice example for us here as writers. London tells us the problem with the guy. He lacks imagination. And then he uses an example. And when you're writing, that's really useful. Make your claim and then prove it. And that's true in fiction and in nonfiction writing. I just see Kurt Kemmerer says, we just learned that word hubris in regards to Julius Caesar on our last work in school, last week at school. Yes, absolutely it shows up in Caesar. Absolutely, right? And oh yeah, oh, I just get all excited and talking about Julius Caesar, one of my favorite plays. Okay, so we see this. London wraps up his first venture into this man's lack of instinct, lack of right thinking. And he's going to conflict it here, right? Where he sees 50 degrees below zero to him was just precisely 50 degrees below zero, right? Like it never entered his head that there should be anything more to consider other than just a number on a thermometer. And he's going to instantly contrast this. He's going to put this statement in juxtaposition with the dog. The dog 
is depressed by the tremendous cold. It knew that it was no time for traveling. Its instinct told us a truer tale than was told to the man by the man than was told by the man's judgment. The dog is the exact opposite of the man. The dog is full of nothing but respect for the cold, even though the dog is better suited to the cold than the man. He still has more respect for it. The man understands thermometers and temperature, but the and the dog doesn't, but the dog understands cold. And I just think that is so interesting. The story just does such an incredible job, right? It experienced a vague but menacing apprehension. I just, oh, I, oh, the feeling. It just does such an incredible job, right? It sl made it slink along at the man's heels and made it question eagerly every unwanted movement of the man, right? Every time the man moved, uh, the dog's like, oh, maybe you're gonna make a fire, right? Um, it just does such a good job, London does, of showing that you can know things that are true and still miss the truth. And I think to me, that's one of the biggest takeaways from this story. You can have all these facts and you put them together and you still miss the point. Okay, so, and then we get this interesting thing because the narrator tells us not just what's going on in the mind of the dog and not just what's going on in the mind of the man, but the narrator steps back and he says, uh, let me cue you in, reader. It wasn't just 50 below zero. It was colder than that. And it was colder than 60 below zero. Colder than 70 below zero. It was 75 below zero. 107 degrees of frost obtained, right? And the narrator is telling the reader something that the characters don't know. And because of this, this is a form of dramatic irony. Okay, here is the man, right? He wasn't much given to thinking and just then particularly had nothing to think about save that he would eat lunch at the Forks and that at six o'clock he would be in the camp with the boys. Are you even serious right now? Like that's what you're worried, like that's what you're thinking about? You are literally in the middle of cold so cold that even being out in it for a moment is deadly and you're just worried about lunch and dinner I mean it's just even if you've ne never read the story you know that you're in the hands of a master storyteller because you know this is going to be important he tells us this and he doesn't even say hey reader this is going to be important later on you know it's going to be important the foreshadowing is completely intertwined with the character development you want to yell at him, you need to start thinking. Like even the dog knew, knows, you need to start thinking, right? Um, uh, it was uh, levels of frost, so degrees of frost. We call it when somebody asks like, what does layers of frost mean? So we're, what we're really looking at is degrees of frost obtained. So, you know, we measure temperature in degrees. And so the freezing is in Fahrenheit 32, which is what they're using in the story, in Celsius zero. And so then the degrees below that are what we would call degrees of frost. It is then how cold it is below that frost number. And the more degrees of frost that are obtained, the more solidly you freeze, the more quickly. So um, once in a while, the thought reiterated itself. It was very cold and he had never experienced such cold. Things that make you go, huh? I think you might want to stop and reflect on that a little bit. No? Okay. Well, empty as the mind, man's mind was of thoughts, he was keenly observant. And I just love this distinction that London draws because he, he between thoughts and observations, right? Like you can observe stuff, you can notice stuff, but if you don't really think about it, if you don't really reflect on it, it doesn't do you any good. He recognizes things. He knows how to tell that the ground is unstable, like he has this practical knowledge that the ground is unstable, and he knows the importance of staying dry. He knows all of those things, but he misses the key idea. Dude, you should not be here right now, right? You should not be here right now. So all of those other things are meaningless. They're useless to you. If you miss the big thing, then the fact that you understood the little things doesn't matter at all. He's capable of intuition and reflection. He just doesn't do it. I mean, that's what London is saying here. All right. And then the dog again. The dog gets wet. If you remember, its paw breaks through and it gets wet. And it, and it immediately 
lays down and starts biting the snow out of its feet and frost off of its paws. And it says, this is a matter of instinct. It didn't know this. It merely obeyed the mysterious prompting that arose from the deep crypts of its being. Now, a crypt is where we bury people. So this is an allusion to the fact that it's like the dogs that came before. It's like the instinct of the animal. Um, and in order to truly understand this story, in order to be more like the dog than the man, you have to pay attention to these times when the dog privileges instinct, when the dog believes in instinct rather than just the base knowledge that the man does. You have to look for where the dog trusts itself. Um, so Emmy is asking, why did he go? And he, it, it says in the beginning why he was going there. He was going there to check something out. It was part of his business, and now he was he was coming back. Um, and he would... it. In the story, it tells you that he's he's done this. It's part of what he's doing to make money. Um, yeah. And then we get this line. I love this line. We see this phrase over and over and over again. It certainly was cold. And we're like, dude, you're in real trouble, right? But what does he do? What does he do? He'd forgotten to build a fire and thaw out. He chuckled at his foolishness. And we're like, we're not laughing. We're not laughing. As he chuckled, he noted the numbness creeping into the exposed fingers, right? It's like, while he's like simultaneously knowing and not knowing. And it's just so beautiful the way that London shows this difference between thinking and intuition and how you need to blend them, how you need to put them together, right? Ooh, I just saw Aaron say a crypt like the cask of Amontillado. Yes, yes, yes. Ooh, 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 15 points. 15 points to Gryffindor, all right, or Ravenclaw. Actually, I'll give him a Ravenclaw, I'm a Ravenclaw. Okay, so look at this, like, hmm, can't feel my fingers. Hmm, too bad I forgot to build a fire, ha ha. This is so crazy. Okay, and then it says, he was a bit frightened. Finally, we get this, finally, finally, some insight. You think, and then that is followed by this exact line again. It certainly was cold, right? And I see somebody saying that the guy's stupid, and what London is saying is, there are different kinds of stupid. Right, there's the kind of stupid where you don't know stuff. And that's not really stupid, that's just ignorance. And and everybody's ignorant until they're not. But then there's the kind of stupid that is where you ignore your instinct. It's where you ignore your intuition. And London is saying that's more dangerous, right? Because the dog didn't have any, like what we would consider the, like book learning, but he was the most wise of all. So, and, okay, so then we get this. That man from Sulphur Creek had spoken the truth when telling how cold it sometimes got, and he had laughed him at a time. It showed one must not be too sure of things. There was no mistake about it. It was cold. So here's that hidden inciting incident. He was warned and he ignored it. Now remember, the inciting incident sets the story in motion. If he had not ignored this warning, if he had heeded this warning, there would be no story. I mean, how many of you would be interested in reading the story that reads like this? Uh, man is warned against leaving in the cold, so decides to wait it out. News at 11. Right? It's not interesting, right? There's no conflict. So here this whole story is this, this huge exploration of foreshadowing. And foreshadowing is when the author is hinting to us that something's going to happen. And we often don't know it until the end. Okay. He filled his pipe and took a comfortable time over a smoke. I'm like, are you even serious? Like, you're just cheerfully, leisurely, just hanging out. Like, are, nothing's going on, but London is just building the tension moment by moment by moment. And I'm curious. Okay, finally question here. Can you think of a time that you've been watching a TV show or a movie and you just wanted to scream at a character who's being stupid? Like sometimes it's super obviously dangerous, you know, like don't open that door. But have you ever gotten frustrated with a character who's just not being wise? I'm curious. Okay, Nerdy Fangirl says, because of the lack of names, it's harder to grow attached to the characters. And that's London's point. He doesn't want you to get too involved in the characters. He wants you to stay focused on the theme. He wants to stay focused on what he's trying to prove. Okay, so I'm hoping that I can see, I like Kurt's um, percentages of Hogwarts houses. Okay, I'm, I'm waiting to see if I can see some characters that you might mention. Um, horror movies, yes, yes. And Chris Potter is saying, yes, it happens all the time, all the time, right? You guys know this, right? And this is just like what's going on. 
in uh, in this story is that people are ignoring it. I love I love watching it. Yeah, action movies that happens all the time. Um, and Pirates of the Caribbean, right? Get on that shit, right? Um, and Plankster says, I'm always frustrated at these characters. It is frustrating. And you bring up an important point. We're supposed to be frustrated by this guy. We're supposed to be so frustrated by this guy that we don't care that he dies. We're like, well, you deserved it. And we're supposed to be frustrated enough that we're willing to consider in our own lives, are we like this, right? He wants us to love the dog. He doesn't want us to love the dog. He wants us to respect the dog. He wants us to believe that the dog is the superior being here because the dog has respect for the cold and for instinct that the dog respects nature and the dog respects instinct and so the dog is wiser we have no affection for the dog there's no like he's not trying to build affection for the dog he's not trying to make us want to pet the dog he's trying to make us want to be more like the dog it's kind of interesting oh iron man indirect yeah nice Yes. Oh, Jackson Williams. We all know that they can't hear us, but we still scream at them, right? <laughs> it's exactly right. Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. Have you ever known a real person? Don't put their name in the chat. But have you ever known a real person who you knew was making a mistake and you wanted to stop them, but you knew that they just wouldn't listen? Or maybe you even did tell them and they don't listen, right? We know people like this, right? We all know people like this. We know, like somebody will tell us they're going to do something and we're just like, I already know that ain't gonna work, right? And so I'm just curious if you guys know, have you had an incident with that, right? Mm. Interesting. Okay, and here we go, right? Here London puts the instinct head to head with knowledge. The guy has knowledge. He can read a thermometer if he doesn't know cold. This man did not know cold, but the dog knew, right? Notice this. He's like, um, he says, possibly all the generations of his ancestry about the man, right, have been ignorant, but the dog knew all his ancestry knew. And so it's like showing this beautiful parallel structure. The man doesn't know, the dog doesn't know. The man's ancestors didn't know, the dog's ancestors did know, right? It's very interesting. On the other hand, there was keen intimacy between the dog and the man. The one was the toil slave of the other, right? Like the workhorse. And the only caresses it had ever received were the caresses of a whip. So the dog made no effort to communicate its apprehension to the man. And I'm curious about this, right? Okay, so the dog, you can tell if a dog is worried about something. Like they whine, they'll come try to get you. We've all heard stories about dogs saving their families from a fire, right? They smell the smoke or like, I mean, we, we've all, there's a whole, whole TV show and a book called Lassie where there's this dog and the dog would like talk, what Lassie? Timmy's in the well, right? Like, so we're, we're used to that. But what's interesting here is the dog doesn't try to save the man. And so here's my question. How would this story have been different if the dog had been the man's pet rather than the man's servant? How would it be different? What do you think, how would the dog have behaved differently? Do you think even the ending might have been different? Like, what do you think would have been different if the man had been the dog's pet? And I've got another question for you. Do we often treat people we know and care about differently from the people who we only owe forced love and allegiance to? I mean, do you have people like, think about even the situation we're in right now, right? Like if somebody you don't even know is like, will you give me a roll of toilet paper? You might feel very differently than if your sister calls you and says, can I have a roll of toilet paper, right? So I think this is really interesting. Okay, see, the dog would have helped him. Dog might have warmed him up. Nice. Dog might have tried to help or warn him. I see a lot of this. The man wouldn't have considered trying to kill a dog. Oh, I think you're right. Yeah. Um, the dog would try to save the man, but the man wouldn't have listened. Oh, that's interesting, right? So the story may have trended a little differently, but still ended the same. Nice. Interesting. Nice. Okay. And then it happened. And then it happened. These are. This is the exact line from the story. And then it happened. And this is how I'm going to prove that London really did intend to have two climaxes because of this. Here we go. And then it happened. At a place where there were no signs, where... The soft, unbroken snow seemed to advertise solidity beneath. The man broke through. And this is why you can't trust knowledge. London is yelling it out. See, I told you, you can know this stuff, but if you don't have intuition, it won't get you anywhere. 
All right, I'm gonna pause at this moment of greatest intensity to discuss one of the sweet 16. Okay, so infinitive phrase, infinitive phrases. And the infinitive phrases are perfect. For a lot of the other stories I've thought, hmm, which of the sweet 16 should I use? And for this one, it was a dead giveaway because it's in the title. To build a fire is an infinitive phrase. So what's an infinitive phrase? It's a group of words that begin with to followed by a verb. And in English, that is what we call the infinitive form of the verb. If you, if any of you speak another language, you know, like um, in, in um, I'll just use Spanish as an example, but we have like tener, to have. It, in Spanish, we have ER verbs, AR verbs, and IR verbs. It's very similar in French with a switch to an RE verb instead. But the ending of the verb, that's the infinitive form. In English, we separate it out as a separate word to. So an infinitive phrase begins with an infinitive, the to form of a verb. So if acting like a noun, they can be the subject of a sentence. So to build a fire was the man's goal. To build a fire was the reason the man stopped along the trail. It can also act, they can also act like adjectives and adverbs. Okay, so let's see some examples. To buy toilet paper was what she wanted most of all. Um, I wanted to buy toilet paper. To buy toilet paper here is the, is the compliment really in this sense. I shopped early to find toilet paper. The toilet paper was hard to find, right? So to find here is not actually the verb. To find here is part of this longer verb phrase. All right, so I want to see what you can do with this. The dad hoped to what? So this is what the dad is faced with. Give me a shot at an infinitive verb or infinitive phrase. The dad hoped to... Oh, look at Kurt pulling out a bunch of... Okay. To have, to be able to, to know to be, I don't know Nadar, poder, to be able to, nice, okay, he hoped to find toilet paper, I am not doing toilet paper because, you know, COVID-19, all right, okay, maybe the toilet paper joke is getting old, I won't use it again, all right, to find the cure, to eat cake, the dad hoped to buy candy. The hype, the dog hoped, or I'm sorry, the dad hoped to avoid his children's constant begging. Hoped to watch the hockey game in peace. No hockey. Um, hoped to buy more toilet paper the store. To tell the football players to shape up. To hope to be the best dad. To not buy ice cream. See, that, that you got it. You got it. Two. These are super easy, right? Because they're going to start with two and, and then a verb. And so they're easier than some of the others. Okay, so you do it the same way, right? The pirate wanted, or the pirate didn't want. Choose one of those and do it. Do one of those. The pirate wanted. Remember, you have to have two in front of the verb. But let me see some of a pirate. The pirate wanted, or the pirate didn't want. You pick whichever one you want. And I'll watch those come through. And I will, I know you're going to do a good job on those because those are super fun. The pirate hoped to go on a quest for the crystal of healing. I like that one. Um, and then be able to get back. Yeah, that's nice. Okay. I, I love to read your, I love to read what you send in. It's so fun to be able to, watch, to find a good book. The pirate wanted to find a pet parrot. I love that one. That's nice. The pirate, uh, I, want, I want the infinitive phrase right after pirate. To sneak candy from his teammates. To find the buried treasure. Nice. To steal a mermaid. That's nice. To find a mermaid. <laughs> That's nice. To gain weight from eating donuts. I think goals, right? Okay, nice job. Okay, so now we're back to our guy. We left off at this climactic moment when he falls through the ice and he knows he has to build a fire, right? Infinitive phrase. He knows he has to build a fire and he does, right? And this leads to this moment of pridefulness. The fire was a success. He was safe. He remembered the advice of the old timer and smiled. The old timer had been very serious in laying down the law that no man must travel alone. And he's like, oh, I know so much better. Watch what he says. Ah! Here he was. He'd had the accident. He was alone. He'd saved himself. Pride. 
Those old timers were rather womanish, some of them, he thought, which is misogynistically offensive. All a man had to do was keep his head and he was all right. Are you serious? Like, it is so prideful that he thinks that, oh, I was able to build this fire this one time, therefore I'm out of the woods, literally. Then it's just crazy. It's just crazy. I was like, I, just, I really, I just felt like this meme, you know, that tell me more about how you saved yourself, right? <laughs> you know, so, so the narrator, this is what the narrator is saying, right? Tell me more, the man, about how you saved yourself. Okay. And I just think, yeah, look at this. It was surprising. Any, any man who was a man could travel alone, but it was surprising the rapidity with which his cheeks and nose were freezing, and he had not thought his fingers could go so lifeless in so short a time. Pride, 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 pride alert. There needs to be like a glow on the screen every time we have a pride alert. And now London emphasizes this different way of thinking, this what you know and what is instinct. And by making the man even more separate from his own body, his, his blood wants to hide away, his fingers feel remote. When he touched a twig, he had to look at it in order to see that he was holding it. The man is being shown that as he is getting more and more away from his instinct, he's actually separating from his body. I mean, it's really interesting, really interesting. And I love this quote. I love this quote from Adam Peaty. I think it feels intended for the antagonist of this story, right? There is a very thin line between confidence and arrogance. Oh, and this is where London is like, this idea, which is all through the story, is where London is saying, you must change. You must change. You must consider when in your life you are overly confident because of what you think you know. And you don't have respect for people who have different ways of knowing than you do. And there are a lot of ways of knowing. Oh, okay. So I want to look at this man versus nature conflict for a little bit because in the story Moby Dick, the main character, Captain Ahab, is chasing his nemesis, a great white whale. And I think it's interesting that in the story that we're reading to build a fire, the man is fighting his nemesis, which is nature itself, which is all white. And in Moby Dick, the protagonist, though, has a lot of respect for the whale. The protagonist, Captain Ahab, absolutely has respect for the whale, but and this is the deadly mistake that the man in To Build a Fire makes, a lack of respect for your opponent. And I actually think this is one of the important takeaways from this story that I have never used in a class before because it wasn't an issue even five years ago. And that is that I think this is an issue in our society right now, that we have a lack of respect for people who have a different way of knowing than we do. And, and I think London is making the argument that's a big mistake, that you may think you're morally or intellectually superior to someone else, but if you disrespect people with other ways of knowing than you, you do so at your peril. And we have this man versus nature conflict in Moby Dick, and we have the man versus nature conflict in To Build a Fire, and the messages are very similar, but because the protagonists respond differently, there's a different lesson for the reader. And then London uses this exact same wording again. It happened. Do you remember before? Then it happened. And then when he broke through the ice and then now it happened. And it's when the snow, he successfully has built the fire, but then the snow falls on the fire and puts it out. It, and this is what happened, right? The snow, it grows like an outlet because it like one, he's, he's bumped it one too many times, just subtle movements. And then a bunch of snow at the top, like not even a bunch, but some snow at the top dislodges and it goes to the next level and the next and the next. And it grew like an avalanche simile. And it descended without warning upon the man and the fire and the fire was blotted out. And in this entire story of all this craziness going on, this is like the sole exclamation mark. So I think you could absolutely argue that this is the climax because... Ja I mean, London is really telling us it's the climax by putting an exclamation mark. I still feel like it's the first time he broke through because I think he would have made it if that didn't happen. Um, and I think that's the moment where we go, oh, but I think maybe, mm, you know what? I think it's this. I'm going to vote this. You know what I'm going to vote this? Because we're not worried enough yet. We're not worried enough yet. When he breaks through the snow, we're not worried enough. Now we're worried. 
Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna vote that climax off the island. I'm this is the one. Okay, and the reason why 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 did he jostle it? Why did he end up with this utter disaster? What's gonna turn out to be a fatal disaster? is because it had been easier to pull the twigs from the brush and drop them directly on the fire rather than doing it the way he should have done, the way that would have protected him. And London is saying, how many times do you do this? You take the easy way and then you pay, right? Ah, okay. Um, I see a comment. I don't understand the man versus nature concept. This is the idea that the man is, he's battling nature, right? He's battling the cold that he's, he, the cold will kill him, but unless he does everything just right. And in order to be successful, he has to defeat nature trying to kill him, right? Essentially, not really, but I mean, it's not trying. It just is nature. London's view of nature is that nature is dark, that nature is dangerous, that you ignore its power at your peril and that it's not sunshine and roses and fields of daffodils, right? It's that it's powerful and and malevolent. And this man versus nature conflict in the story is that we've got this man called the man in conflict with nature because that he keeps coming up against the cold. He comes up against the cold. He comes up against the ice. He comes up against the snow. He comes up against wetness. He comes up everything. Everything that is working against him is part of nature. Such were his thoughts, but he did not sit and think them. And by now we realize this is a mistake, right? By now we're like, oh yeah, this is a big mistake. And this is again in my copy, in my, in mine. And I just want to say that I have probably read this story literally a hundred times. I'm not exaggerating. That is not hyperbole. And I still, if you see my copy, it's all, th this is what, this is what reading looks like. You read with a pen. I know people think you read with your eyes and your mind, and you do, but you also read with a pen. So in my copy all over, I have like, I don't know if you can see it, S-O-U-E. <laughs> it was like this code I was using for myself. Here comes another one. Here comes another unfortunate event. So I'm curious, what are some of the S-O-U-E's, for those of you who made it through to the end, um, kudos to you. What were some of the unfortunate events you noticed after this point, after the snow falls and puts out the fire? One, um, one, any of the unfortunate events you notice. So I'll see those come through. The, oh, and now we have this. The old timer on Sulphur Creek was right, he thought, in the moment of controlled despair. After 50 below, a man should travel with a partner. And then finally, right, finally the man shows some respect, but it's too little too late. It's too little too late. And the, the dog realizes it. There's an interesting narrative shift that goes on here, right? So the man is unsuccessful in building the fire. He and the dog realizes it and um, and the man dies of hypothermia and the narrative voice shifts from a, mostly the perspective of the man with a couple of glimpses into the mind of the dog to now into fully the mind of the dog. And it because we're going from we've got a big shift here quickly. If you're reading the 17 page version, especially the narrative shifting is quick. It's quick. We go from the man's mind to the dog's mind and then to the narrator's mind. Bam, bam, bam. And this is a beautiful example of third person omniscient narration where the narrator can go into everybody's mind and the man. Okay, wait, you know what? I, I jumped ahead. We're not at the scene where the man is dead yet. Um, In this scene is when the man decides like do you remember that scene in star wars where luke skywalker like kills that animal and like stays warm in its guts the man decides he's gonna do that but when he tries to call the dog the dog's instinct saves it because in his note was a strange note of fear it's like so crazy right something was matter it knew its brain in its brain arose an apprehension of the man and that instinct instinct for the win again now as the man is dying of hypothermia we have this beautiful illusion we have this beautiful reference to, to Mercury, also called Hermes, depending on whether you're reading Greek or Roman mythology. And Hermes was the messenger god. Hermes, um, the Nike swoosh is based on this wing on his foot. And in this line, London captures the beautiful mind of hypothermia. He lets us feel the euphoria of feeling like a dog, like a, like, not like a dog, like a god 
He doesn't say, he felt really great. He just uses this illusion to let us know that as the guy is trying to run over the snow on frozen feet, this is how he feels. He was losing his battle, in his battle with the frost, it was creeping into his body. It certainly was cold. This is the most clear that an author can be, especially this line right here, in describing man versus nature conflict. That he's losing his battle with the frost. He's setting it up as a war. And in this genre of literature called realism or naturalism or naturalist realism, um, it shows nature not as beautiful and loving, but harsh and powerful and dangerous as an enemy. It certainly was cold. And the last words of the character, this is the last thought we get from the man. The narrative, you were right, you were right. And this is what's interesting. We have a dynamic character. We have a dynamic character in the man. The man changes. And what's interesting is, Usually in a story, the protagonist is the dynamic character, which is true here, but normally that makes the protagonist more likable. And here we're just like, buddy, you're too late. And so London is really playing with the idea of a dynamic character still being insufficient, still being weak, still being not, not good. Um, so interesting. And then the dog. And now we shift into the dog, right? And this reminder that instinct and intuition will trump knowledge without thinking seven days a week, right? Intuition. And intuition isn't just an idea that springs into your mind. It's experience plus knowledge. Plus, and, it's, and it's experience either yours or that of people who've gone before you. And the man fails because he knows things, right? But he ignores the experiences of others. So he lacks intuition, because he ignores instinct. What's weird is that usually in stories, the important characters change, as I mentioned. And here the dog doesn't change, but the dog is absolutely the important character. All right, so we get into the theme of justice with our story. Yeah, he changes, but way too late. Nice, yes. Um, and then we get into this theme of justice. And I think our... Um, do you think that nature exacts justice on the man for his lack of instinct and arrogance. Like, is that a form of justice? Is it a form of justice that because he was so prideful that nature enacts this justice on him? And is that fair? Like, is it fair if that's true? Like, is it fair for nature to kill him? And then which do you think the man needed more, instinct or humility? Mm. Okay, now... I'm going to tell you, I'm looking at all these. He isn't the brightest bulb, the sharpest tool, or even remotely smart. He is the dimmest bulb or the dullest tool. Nice. God uses nature to keep us under control and on our toes. Nature certainly can keep you on your toes. Mm. Nice. Okay. So I, this is the little surprise I have for you. Okay. I have had a lot of people asking me, about like what about after this like we want to stay connected and how we do that and so I created an email list so if you're under 13 don't sign up for it have a parent if you want to stay in the in touch but I'll be sharing resources and ideas and maybe we'll be doing some more live stuff when our class is over whatever but if you want to stay in the know you can sign up on this email list and you will get an email from me whenever we're going to do something interesting or whenever I have something I think you might um, be interested in okay and I'm going to give you a second to mark that down while I look through yes it's very good to respect nature but humility is needed more interesting um, I think he needed humility because he would have taken a partner with him. Nice. And they feed into each other. Amelia Jane says they feed into each other. Man's lack of humility leads him not to listen to his instinct. Ah, nice. Nice. If he had less pride, he would have listened. He wouldn't need an instinct. Well, I think he would have needed instinct, but maybe he would. it would have come to him. Nice. Okay. So now I can't wait to go read all of these. I really can't. Okay. The writing. The writing rock stars. Okay. Now remember. When I'm selecting samples for the writing, I'm, I'm, what I'm looking for are examples of things that I think are strong and or are examples of things that some people are struggling with and I wanna pull out an example of someone who was able to capture a strong way to do it. And so I do that when I'm making the lesson and I, I usually am doing that the night before that I'm working on that. And so once I already have a bunch of examples of what I'm trying to show, 
if I read yours, no matter how good it is, it may not get featured, right? So this isn't a sample of th these are the only good ones. It's not like that. It's that there's, there's only so much time. Okay, so let's see some examples. Up through eighth grade, sample one. So each time Daisy kicked at Alice, it only encouraged a negative response from Alice. I just get so excited when I see this embedded text evidence. I, I hate to say this because I like it so much, but in pieces, this short that we're doing, just like essentially one or two paragraphs, you don't need to actually give the citation that she does in parentheses. I mean, it's beautiful. I don't want to discourage it. I don't want to discourage it. But you don't have to have it, right? Go ahead and do it just to make me smile. But you don't have to have it. Like when you're writing in class, you don't have to have that. Um, but I love this, right? Every time Daisy kicked at Alice, notice she, the person here is just embedding this quote. It's of flowing through of the sentence. So beautiful, so beautiful. And then this one made me laugh out loud. Um, this was someone who retold the story, like how, what was another way, this is the prompt of what was another way that Daisy could have handled it. And they wrote a whole story and the end of the story was Daisy gets in the car at the end of the day and her mom says school's canceled for the rest of the year because of coronavirus. And I, that just made me laugh so, so much. Um, Okay, and then I love this idea. Um, this person, this was a seventh grader, and they had the idea that what Daisy should do is she should just eat more, like eat more ice cream, make some gains, get bigger and heavier, and then Alice would leave her alone. And I think there's some truth to that because you have to have some kind of power over somebody in order to bully them. But I just love this. And this was the line, right? People don't pick on people they're scared of. All right, next examples. I didn't have a fourth one from there, apparently. Um, so we'll go to ninth and 10th grade. And this is the question of, um, this prompt was the one about, is it fair for authors to use derogatory terms like fat Alice? And what I want you to see in this, not only does the writer have a good idea here, look at the construction. Look at the construction of this sentence. Okay, so I've highlighted the construction. So this is a beautiful sentence. I've broken it up for you. Okay, I would take out the I think that, right? Remember, you don't need to say I think that or in my opinion, we all know that because you're the one writing it. So clearly it's what you think. All right, so you can take that part out. But then look at this. We've got two independent clauses. When authors use terms like this one, they always have a purpose in mind if they are thoughtful writers. And then we have the second independent clause. When a good thoughtful writer writes, everything in the story has a purpose. Okay, those are connected together by a strong coordinating conjunction. The coordinating conjunctions are the conjunctions that can hold two independent clauses. And those are what we call the fanboys, for, and, nor, but, or, yet, so. And so those are what you would put in between two independent clauses, and this writer does that. And then notice this, all oh, the structure here, it just, it's beautiful. The, they have, they start the first independent clause with the main clause of the sentence, and then this phrase. Then they begin the next independent clause with this, little dependent clause and then the main clause. So they've got main clause, sub, conjunction, sub, main. And it's just this beautiful mirror. This was absolutely gorgeous. Absolutely gorgeous. All right. I thought that this was, um, this eighth grader was writing to the ninth grade prompt and it's just really nicely done. Look at this clear argument with a clear simile. Um, so the author makes this argument. The, the writer does, right? Authors do not have any obligation to avoid unkind language in their writing. Bam, say it. I want to see that in your opening line, right? In fact, unfavorable nicknames and stories often help the reader. These names are like a compass for the reader if they are trying to find a villain. Beautiful simile. Oh, this was lovely. All right, next. Oh, this is just a sample of a bunch of the transition words that I saw in these different... Um, in, in different pieces. I pulled these from different people's writing. I want to see more transitions. You want to guide the reader through your argument, through the use of transitions. So use that transition word handout. I'm going to make it prettier for you when we're done with class and send it out again. If you're on that email list, you'll get it so that you can have it. But this is nice. Um, and then the next sample that we have, I just want to show examples of transitions. And then I thought this was an interesting argument that someone made, that Daisy was being physically bullied, but she was mentally bullying Alice at the same time. And I thought that was a fascinating argument because Alice is definitely not at all a sympathetic character in this story. And yet here, 
this writer is making the argument that by calling her fat Alice, even in her mind, she was mentally bullying Alice. And so she was using words and Alice was using actions, but they were equally culpable. And I thought that was a really fascinating um, point. All right, 11th and 12th graders. Okay, I this is another example of that, that idea of a strong opening. Now, this one is particularly interesting because it's a strong opening that's almost impossible to prove and yet the person did. All right, so if this story had happened in modern day America, everything would change. Everything is a really big word, right? If you can do that and actually do it, like if you're successful in it, you can you can make this big, total broad sweeping argument, everything would change, and then you are able to prove that everything would change, then you're a rock star, right? And then look at these beautiful transition words. The first thing that can be changed Alternatively, more importantly, nowadays, I mean, this is like a poster of how to use transitions that you cannot help as a reader, but be guided through the, the writer's argument. It was truly lovely. Okay, I want to, I want to um, encourage you, before I show you the writing prompt for today, um, before we get into writing, I would just like to say... For those of you who rated this story low, I would ask you to give it a second read. I would ask you to give it a second read. We've already discussed why second reads are important in general, but I would like you to give it a second read looking for specifically how it's speaking to you. Not just in general making statements about how instinct is, is good and how nature isn't always your friend, but I want you to look at what what changes do you need to make in the way that you think because of having read this story. And um, again, you might want a blankie. All right, our writing prompts for today. Again, you're you're welcome to write at, to a different prompt, but I, I make these prompts at different levels of sophistication. So if you're gonna write at the 11th and 12th grade prompt level, you're going to need to ratchet up your game. You're going to need to be sophisticated or you won't be able to be successful. So do the one you think you can do successfully or extend just a little bit. Don't do one that you think you can, look like could only do on your very, very best day, right? Okay, so let me make my face a little smaller so I don't block out the, uh, block it out. Okay, so uh, through eighth grade, Discuss three key points in the plot that could have turned the story around and be specific about the incident, right? I want to see some text evidence. Where could the man have made a different decision or something could have happened differently that would have turned the story around? And I want you to do it for after uh, he falls through the ice, not before. So you can't just say he would never have set out. Don't do that. That will be too easy. All right. Then if you are in ninth or 10th grade. I want to know how could the man have improved his instinct even while he was already on the trail, okay? Even while he's already on the trail, how could he have gotten better at the instinct? How could he have made it better? And then, um, and or, or do you think it's too late? Was he fated from the beginning? In which case, you could also make the argument this is a man versus fate conflict. So that could be, there. there's some openness there in that prompt for you guys. Then for 11th and 12th graders, argue that the dog as part of nature is part of the man's enemy. In what ways is the dog the man's enemy? And basically what I'm asking is, should the dog have helped? Like was the dog, is there some maliciousness almost in the dog refusing to help the man? That is a hard prompt to answer. That is by far the most difficult prompt there because it's hard to do. All right, so I am really, oh, okay, somebody has a question. What do you mean by improving his instinct? What I mean by that is that the, the man is, London is hammering us with this man has no instinct, this man has no instinct. But was it possible for the man's instinct to have improved during the course of the story, right? He never respects instinct until the very, very end when he says, oh, maybe that guy knew something after all. Maybe you shouldn't go out alone in this kind of cold. But he doesn't have that awareness until the end. Is it possible how could the man have improved his instinct early on? What are things that have happened in the story that he might have read and improved his instinct with, like how if he had taken it differently, if he had responded differently, if he had thought about it more? I don't want to give away all your possible great ideas here. Um, 
And then just one last thought I'll tell you is that I um, do, uh, I review the writing in the evening and then I review the writing some in the morning. But if you submit your writing later in the morning before class, well, in the morning for me, later before, I, I just won't have time because I have too, I have like too many of the technical pieces that have to get in place. And so I might not get to yours. So you definitely want to be submitting the writing by like two hours before class starts because I, I, otherwise I might not get to it. So just FYI. Okay. Um, and then let's get to our, you're going to submit it into, you guys are doing such a great job in this. You're finding where to do it. Submit it into the build a fire. And then for tomorrow, ooh, warning, 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 the lottery. Oh man. Okay. If you thought this story was dark and disturbing, then the lottery is going to blow your mind. I mean, the lottery is hands down by far, uh, the most disturbing story I've ever read. So, um, don't read it right before you go to bed. <laughs> um, the lottery, and there aren't multiple versions of this one. It's not very long. You don't, um, you don't, you don't, it's not 17 pages, so you don't need an alternate one. So I'm very interested to see what you think about the lottery. It's like probably, mm, yeah, interesting. So if you're scary, it's scary, scary, scary. Okay, how would the story change if the dog was muffin? <gasps> Oh, oh, that's so good. That's so good. That's so good. Can you write longer than 100 words? Yep, absolutely. Absolutely. If you've read the lottery twice before, then you should get even more out of it. Try if like if you have already read one of the stories that we're reading, that's a huge benefit to you because now then you can just like participate even more and you can use some of the skills that you've learned in analysis in the class and apply them. It's going to be so good. All right. Um, Heidi Davis says my shoes are literally Uggs and Heidi, uh, totally representing cause I am also wearing Uggs. I mentioned that Mr. Van is Australian and so we get Uggs in Australia. All right. Well, this is Mrs. Van, your friendly neighborhood English teacher signing off until tomorrow. Same bat time, same bat channel. See you then.